Basketball is special. The size of the court and the lack of pads or helmets give fans the most intimate experience of a team sport that exists. And because of the different styles that basketball allows for, players develop their own distinct identities and signature styles through their creativity, flair, and athleticism. And although no player succeeds alone, the scoring volume and two-way nature of the sport give individual stars a nearly unprecedented amount of control over the flow and outcome of a game. For this reason, players are constantly compared to their peers and to the legends of the past in order to answer the most hotly contested question in the sport. Who's the greatest to ever do it? For many, the question is redundant. They believe in only one right answer, their answer. Others might have their own personal stance, but acknowledge one or two alternatives. But I believe that there's much more nuance to the question of greatness and more answers to it than you might think. By my count, there are eight players in NBA history that have a substantial claim as the GOAT. It's a subjective thing though. I can't give you a definitive answer. All I can do is make the argument. So today, I'll be making the case for Magic Johnson as the greatest basketball player of all time. The year is 1979. Professional basketball in America is at perhaps the lowest point in its history. No one is going to games, the ratings are garbage, none of the players are very marketable, and the product is so bad that CBS isn't bothering to air playoff games live. Things look bad. Enter Irvin Johnson. Johnson bested Larry Bird's undefeated Indiana State Sycamores in the 1979 NCAA Championship an event that retains the highest TV rating of a game of basketball ever. When the Lakers used their number one overall pick to make Johnson the first underclassman ever to be taken as the top draft choice, you have to wonder if they knew exactly who they just drafted. How could they have known that they had just drafted a player that would become an icon for their franchise, for their city, and for a generation of basketball history? They didn't draft Irvin Johnson, the prospect from Michigan State. They drafted Magic. Right off the bat, for whatever it's worth, Magic Johnson has the coolest nickname in NBA history. It fits him to a T and is really the name that everyone knows him by. It's not like his last name is superfluous, like with Kobe, LeBron, or Kareem. And it's not like his last name is eternally iconic, like Russell, Jordan, or Duncan. It's just Magic. Johnson came into the NBA and immediately injected it with life like he was an epinephrine pen. Magic's winning smile, charismatic interviews, and revolutionary playstyle introduced the league to a pulse and a personality it hadn't known since Wilt Chamberlain. Before long, he became the frontman of a team that would be known by its own distinct nickname, Showtime, like it was a piece of theater or art in and of itself. He was the lead man of the most popular show in Hollywood. In a city full of celebrities, he was the main attraction. Not only did he have the smile and personality to carry a name like Magic, but he also had the basketball aptitude to pull off a team called Showtime. What did he do with that aptitude? He won five championships, a half decade's worth, and appeared in nine finals. Only Kareem, Bill Russell, and Sam Jones have appeared in more. He won three regular season MVPs in a span of four years, won three Finals MVPs, made 12 All-Star teams, and was selected to 10 All-NBA teams. And keep in mind that all of these accomplishments took place in a 12-year career, 11 if you want to mention his injury-shortened 81 season. Magic only spent three years of his playing career watching the Finals from home. I spent more years trying to graduate from college than Magic spent not making the Finals. His HIV diagnosis came right on the heels of a season in which he finished as the runner-up for league MVP, was selected to first-team All-NBA, and competed in the NBA Finals. It is not hyperbole or exaggeration to say that Magic's career was cut short while he was still 90% as good as he'd ever been. Those 12 years were enough of a basketball pedigree though that even now, some 30 years later, he is still universally considered the greatest point guard of all time. A fact made both impressive and unfortunate considering how much more he had to give. Still, Magic's career stacks up against anyone else with a claim to basketball's highest throne.
and the legend surrounding Magic Johnson is rooted in the undeniable truth that Magic Johnson is the best passer in the history of basketball. With the ball in his hand, he was no longer a basketball player. He became a force of nature. His movements became sublime and fluid. These passes aren't coming from Magic. I refuse to believe that any human could do this kind of stuff so routinely without divine intervention. These passes are coming from the basketball gods, and Magic Johnson became their instrument. To convince you, I shouldn't need to show you anything other than his ability, but the stats bear it out. Magic has the highest assist per game average ever, and also has the most assists in NBA playoff history. Magic's skills extended beyond just passing though. Too big to be guarded by traditional point guards and too quick to be guarded by slow-footed forwards, he created matchup problems every time he brought the ball across midcourt. His speed with the ball was unrivaled and accompanied with his remarkable rebounding proficiency was a key feature in the Lakers' fast-break offense. He was adept at finishing with either hand, something he did often thanks to his underrated first step. Years of practice by himself and with Kareem helped Magic develop a high post game that added yet another dimension to his offensive skill set. Magic was also adept at picking his opponent's pockets, leading the league in steals per game twice. This skill set is made even more impressive when you remember that Magic was the same height as Karl Malone. That might be my favorite thing about Magic, that he was a true authentic point guard who happened to be 6'9". It wasn't like with Tim Duncan, who played power forward but people say was actually a center, or how James Harden is listed at shooting guard even though he plays more like a point guard. Magic was an honest-to-God point guard who could also play every position on the basketball court. As an individual defender, Magic was capable, never a lockdown guy, but he was as versatile and as switchable as they come. And with such solid rebounding numbers, there were no holes in Magic Johnson's offensive game. When I say that Magic immediately began making an impact on the NBA, I do mean immediately. His rookie year is still one of the most successful campaigns a first-year player has ever had. He took over the job as starting point guard and helped guide the Lakers to 60 wins and a berth in the NBA Finals, where the Lakers faced Julius Irving's Philadelphia 76ers. The series was competitive throughout, with each contest being decided by 10 points or fewer through the first five games. In Game 5, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, the reigning league MVP and the Lakers' best player, badly sprained his ankle. Kareem was able to return and will his team to a five-point victory, putting the Lakers ahead in the series, three games to two. With only one more win needed to clinch the title, Kareem was ruled unavailable for Game 6 in Philadelphia. Magic was then called upon to start the game at center and try to replace Kareem's 33-point-per-game average in the series. Magic answered that call and delivered one of the most memorable basketball performances by any player ever. 42 points, 15 rebounds, 7 assists, 3 steals, and a block, all as a 20-year-old rookie playing on the road on basketball's highest stage. For his efforts, Magic was named Finals MVP, the first and only rookie to win the award. In the years that followed, Magic's basketball journey would be inextricably linked to that of Larry Bird. It's nearly impossible to talk about one without mentioning the other. In my Making the Case video for Larry Bird, I brought up arguments that could be used in favor of Bird's superiority. And because this is a video about Magic's claim of supremacy, I figure I ought to do the same for him. You first have to give credit to Magic for being the most decorated player during perhaps the most talent-laden period the NBA has ever seen. Including his finals opponents, Magic faced competition like Elijah Wan and Samson's Rockets, Tom Chambers' Suns, Mark Aguirre's Mavs, Isaiah Thomas's Pistons, Moses Malone and Dr. J's 76ers, Michael Jordan's Bulls, and Bird's Celtics. Magic's detractors might try to devalue his team's success by pointing out that he played for a remarkably talented team thanks to a brilliant front office. Because of his team's talents, these detractors say, Magic can't be individually credited for their success. In the interest of making Magic's case though, I'd first acknowledge that yes, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar was the best basketball player in the world for nearly the entire 1970s and had already led a team in Milwaukee to a championship by the time Magic arrived in LA. Yes, James Worthy was one of the most polished and accomplished prospects to come out of college basketball in some time. 
And that's not to mention other pivotal role players like Michael Cooper, Kurt Rambis, and Byron Scott, who all played outstanding basketball. I acknowledge all of that, but I'd argue that the greatness of the Showtime Lakers does not take anything away from Magic's abilities as a player or as a leader. If anything, it reinforces the fact that Magic is one of the most effective leaders basketball has ever seen. By the start of the 84-85 season, he had organically flourished into the alpha dog of the team and respectfully taken the torch from Kareem without a power struggle. It's one of the only times in NBA history that there was a peaceful transition of power from one player to the next. Pro basketball is like 15th century England in that sense. There are no peaceful transitions of power. The fact that Magic was able to earn the respect and commitment of his teammates, especially one of the most historically dominant players ever in Kareem, is a testament to Magic's greatness. Beside the departure of Norm Nixon, the Lakers' previous point guard, there were no ugly breakups. Cooper, Rambis, Scott, Worthy, and Kareem all retired at one point or another as Lakers. If you won't believe me, listen to the words of Bill Simmons, former ESPN columnist, current CEO of The Ringer, and noted Boston sports supporter who grew up rooting against Magic. Simmons says he's the single best leader in the history of the sport. Nobody extracted more from teammates, whether it was an all-star game, a mundane affair in December, or any playoff game. It's also important to note that Magic was ready to win right from the get-go. Like I said earlier, he won Finals MVP as a rookie and finished as the runner-up for regular season MVP in his final full year. Unlike nearly every other player who's ever laced him up, there was never a year where Magic's productivity dropped below his eye-popping, jaw-dropping standards. 12 years of Magic Johnson means 12 years of top-shelf, undeniable, incomparable greatness. Magic's critics might say that he didn't score enough, that his defense was too suspect to be considered the greatest, or that his play wouldn't translate into the league today. To all of that, I'd argue that one of the best things about basketball is how many different ways there are to win. You can be a 6'3 sharpshooter like Steph Curry and revolutionize the game, a 7'1 behemoth like Shaq who dominates the league, or anything in between. There are so many viable ways to play the game that have all resulted in championships, MVPs, and the like. Magic's play style allowed him to control the game with a vice grip and tailor it to his specific brand of basketball. What's a player supposed to do when it comes to how the game might evolve in the future? When people talk about the way Magic played, they sometimes talk about it almost like it's a kind of historical casualty. That bewilders me. What Magic did worked really well. Why should he have done anything different? Magic changed the NBA for the better. He was the first positionless player, someone who broke the mold and opened the basketball watching public's eyes to the possibilities of letting great players do what they're great at rather than just fulfilling the traditional roles of their size or position. As the game evolves more and more into a positionless sport, Magic's influence and value only become more and more apparent. His Showtime Lakers also became one of the first teams to make the game of basketball aesthetic. The speed, athleticism, and skill we all enjoy today is due in part to Showtime and Magic Johnson. In my video about Larry Bird, I gave him a lot of credit for saving the NBA, and deservedly so. Larry was a pioneer of basketball and contributed immensely to the explosion of the game's popularity. But for every breath of fresh air that Larry contributed, Magic did the same. You can't talk about one without the other because it was the rivalry between the two that really saved the league. The fact that they competed against each other in such a high-profile game in college, had nearly polar opposite personalities, were of different races, played for the two most historic teams in the country, and met each other multiple times in the finals, all cements theirs as the defining rivalry of the NBA. Despite the differences in their personalities though, their games were remarkably similar. Team first, success-oriented mindsets, and proclivities for passing were trademark features of both their styles. Those styles met three times in the finals, each in legendary fashion. Magic would have the last laugh though, with two championship series wins against Bird. By the time the 1987 finals, their last series against each other, rolled around, Magic had developed a killer instinct and flair for the dramatic matched only by his rival. 
In Game 4 of the series, with the Lakers leading two games to one, Magic all but iced the series with the most legendary shot of his career. Down one with seconds left in a raucous Boston Garden, Magic ripped the heart out of every Celtics fan with his baby sky hook. with two seconds to go. It was the moment of the 87 finals and the shot of Magic's career. He capped off the most remarkable season of his career by vanquishing his most intense rival for the second time in three years. Bill Simmons described how momentous the shot and ensuing championship win was for Magic's legacy. Not even the biggest Celtics fan on the planet could deny it any longer. Magic Johnson was just as exceptional as Larry Bird. This point is echoed by Bird himself in a clip I'll leave you with. After the game, Bird remarked how impressed he was with Magic's performance and ability as a basketball player. It's only an 11 second clip, but there's a moment in it that just strikes me. There's a split second where you can see the disbelief in Larry's eyes as he tries to come to terms with the fact that the game and likely the series is over. In that second, you can almost see him ponder all of the work he put in during the season all the games he played and the shots he took, all in the hopes of getting a chance to beat his old rival. And then he has to reconcile the fact that that old rival got the better of him, plain and simple. Bird wasn't alone in having to reconcile being beaten by Magic Johnson. Magic still maintains the highest win percentage for a career in NBA history. It's the same thing countless players and coaches had to come to terms with during Irvin Magic Johnson's 12 magical years with the Los Angeles Lakers. Here's Bird, summing it all up with a look. Magic's just a great basketball player. He's the best I've ever seen, you know. I... Unbelievable. I don't know what to say. Hey there friend, thanks for watching the video. If you liked it, maybe go ahead and subscribe because I will be making the case for other players in the future. I've already made the case for Larry Bird and Tim Duncan, so feel free to check those out in the meantime. You can also mosey on over to my website where I write stuff about like what Star Wars character each NBA team would be. Make sure to wash your hands. Okay, love you, bye.